This has got a good clap to it. I think we can march to that, don't you?
sounding good, church.
Father, we come before you today asking you, Lord, to have your way in this service. And I just give it all to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Do we have any prayer needs today? Williams had a praise report. She finally got moved into her new house. Amen. Good, good report from Carol. Anybody else? Yes, Levi. You don't know what to say. What you got, Ben? I prayed for Leo. He isn't feeling well. Leo and Mama and Daddy, they aren't feeling very well. Okay. And healing you and your family. Okay, Kevin? Okay. Yes, Polly. For our nation. For our nation. Amen. My brother's um little baby, they just are starting to adopt. Um he is at the children's hospital right now, so we pray for him. Okay. We'll just pray that everything works smoothly and God's will be done. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Pray for the beginning of a new school year. The new school year. Uh, okay. Okay, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you today thanking you, Lord, for these praise reports. Thanking you, Lord, that every prayer we've ever lifted up to you, you've answered. We thank you, Father, for touching a family that's adopting today. We ask that you give them your uh, your will and your guidance, Lord, and give them favor. Lord, I just pray for those that are sick that we've mentioned today, for our country. Lord, that you would look, heal our nation. And Lord, I just pray that it, as each of us receives from the word of God, Lord, through the spiritual meal today, that we would receive it and let it be nourishment to us and let it be growth in our spiritual man. And we just ask that you have your will be done in our lives today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> We're in Joshua chapter 11, if you'll find that, and I've got a bunch of scriptures up here on our overhead, for those of you who have your back to it, you can get a mirror maybe and try to make that out, so, that was my attempt at humor, yeah, granny got it, Okay, this is the last chapter of battles in Joshua. As you know, we've been going through the book of Joshua, and we've been studying the battles, haven't we? I'm going to slide this just a little closer. Maybe this, I'll put the mic up here on my podium. Maybe it won't get too noisy with me rustling things around. Okay, um, we have been going through the book of Joshua, haven't we? Right? Yes, sir. Yes. Anybody else here besides me? Okay, we've been going through the book of Joshua. We have learned a lot of things, haven't we? And there's a lot of parallels here with the Christian walk, isn't there? We've learned that crossing over Jordan was not going to heaven. I don't know how many times I've said that, but I just want to keep saying it because I keep finding references where people think crossing over Jordan is your trip to heaven. There's no battles in heaven, right? You won't get there and have to fight for your place in heaven. This is what the promised land was. 
crossing over Jordan turns out to be a trip, stepping over into Christian maturity, right? In the 40 years they wandered in the wilderness, the children of Israel did nothing but murmur and complain, and they were in defeat the whole time, right? They had bad things happen. They ran out of water. They ran out of food. But instead of just humbly asking God for it, what did they do? They complained, didn't they? They murmured. They said, we should be back in Egypt. Egypt was a type of living in sin, living in the world like we are now before we're born again. That would be like us saying, we should have never asked Jesus to come in our heart. We should have never been saved because it was much easier before we were Christians. And it seems that way sometimes. What you have to do is learn maturity, don't we? We have to learn that to step into maturity. So by the time they got to the Jordan River, all the people that murmured and complained were gone. It was the older generation, but it wasn't because they were old that made them wrong. Right? It was just because they were disobedient and because they were not humble and then because they did not just follow God and trust in him. They had no faith, did they? So when Joshua gets here, Moses has just died. Joshua is taking command and they cross the Jordan. And remember that, that they had to sit three days by a flooded river while they had to wait to think about how they were going to get over Jordan. <coughs> God wanted them to give them three days so that they just would realize there's no way we can get over. Right? Some of you have tried to cross creeks before that was hard to cross. And they finally, after three days, that, that was their test. The three days, they God said, just do what I tell you to do and you'll get over. And they stepped into the water. It was not parted like with Moses. They started wading out. But as soon as they put their feet on the bottom of that creek, the creek parted, right? You know, the Jordan River. It parted for them. So we learned that. We learned in Jericho that obedience, simple obedience had to do with being victorious. Correct? So in the Christian walk, we learn simple obedience through this. We learn that we've got to be obedient and follow God. And if he says things that don't even make sense, and I've got to tell you, marching around for seven days around a city and doing nothing but marching, that doesn't make sense to me. Right? Makes no sense. How many times have you done things in your past that made no sense, and then all of a sudden God said, today's the day it's going to make sense. Right? We've had that, those things happen. So obedience, simple obedience without questioning God is important to Christian maturity. We learned in AI that sin always sets us back. Remember, it was the sin where uh, Achan went in and he took things out of Jericho that he was not supposed to take. And he, and he had brought sin into the camp and sin caused some men, I think it was 36 men died because of it, right? Doesn't sound like a large number. I guarantee you there's 36 families that wish Achan had not done that. In Gibeon, we learned that there was deception. This was the, the two chapters ago, there was deception. Where the men, you remember, remember the men, they dressed in their old clothes and they said, we're from hundreds of miles away. And when we started, this cheese was new and this milk was fresh and, and this bread was, and look at the bread, how old. We could, we could play softball with this thing. You know, they made out like they were from far away and they were three days away. Right? They lied to them. And because they lied, they tricked them into making a peace treaty with them. And because of it, they were cursed. And we learned in that not to make deals with the devil. Right? Uh, the devil, if he can't come at you and defeat you with head-on fights and battles, he'll try to, get, he'll try to uh, worm his way into your life. Mm -hmm. See, he's not so bad. He's not so bad. Right? And in the last chapter, we learned about the five kings of Jerusalem, this, this uh, alliance that came in against Israel, and they began to battle thinking they were going to win, and they ended up, all the kings went into the cave, and we talked about grace. And sometimes the grace of God is there. It doesn't make sense. You don't know how it happened, but the grace of God is there. And so we learned in, in, the, in the walk of Christian maturity, you have grace in your life, right? We learned about Paul's thorn in his flesh and how he had, God said, my grace is sufficient for you, even though there's a thorn there. It's enough. I'll have, you'll have enough to get you through. This time we're going to look in Joshua chapter 11 
and we're, this is the last chapter of battles. These are the final victories for the nation of Israel. If we, if we read in verse 1, it says, It came to pass when Jabin, king of Hazor, had heard those things that he sent to Jobab, king of Madon, and to the king of Shemron, and to the king of Asaph, and to the kings that were on the north of the mountains and the plains south of Chinneroth in the valley and the borders of Dor on the west, and then to the Canaanite on the east and on the west, and to the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Jebusite in the mountains, to the Hivite under Hermon in the, in the land of Mizpah. So all these kings gathered together. Now you notice that there's a lot of them. The problem was not just that there were so many. You know what? Numbers did not matter to Israel. But you know what did matter? Size. Size. And there's a little trick in this chapter that there was something here that 40 years earlier had shut down Israel, and that was there were giants here. There were giants here. Look in uh, verse 15. As the Lord commanded Moses his servant, so did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. So Joshua took all that land, the hills, and all the south country, and all the land of Goshen, and the valley, and the plain, and the mountain of Israel, and the valley of the same, even from Mount Halak that goeth up to Seir unto Belgad, and the valley of Lebanon under Mount Hermon, and all their kings he took, and smote them, and slew them. Joshua made a long time, made war a long time with all those kings. There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel, save the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon, all others they took in battle. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly, and that they might have no favor, but that he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. And at that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakims from the mountains, from Debron to Debir, from Anab and from the mountains of Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel, Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. There was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza and Gath, and in Ashdod there remaineth. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had said unto Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel according to their divisions by their tribes, and the land rested from war. I like that last line, don't you? The land rested from war. You know, nobody wants war. People that want war are not in their right mind, are they? They have not really weighed out or, or they've not been, um, if they want war, there's something wrong with them. But sometimes you get pushed into war, don't you? And sometimes the devil will take things from you. You have to take back. Now, these Anakims that it's talked about in verse 21 and 22, those are the giants. And those are the giants in Deuteronomy that the 12 spies went in and you remember the story how the 12 spies went in and 10 of them said, we can't take it. We look like grasshoppers to those folks. We can't do it. They didn't look at Jericho and have a problem. They didn't look at Gibeon and have a problem. They didn't look at Ai and have a problem, but they looked at these giants and they said, there's a problem. Right? Do you remember the, um, the group of grapes, cluster of grapes that said two men had to carry it on a staff? Right? Those men came back with that those grapes dangling between them and seeing what a great thing it was. Look what's in the promised land. What's in the promised land is good stuff, right? But the devil says, but there's giants there. The giants in your life will always try to keep you from what you're supposed to be doing. They will always try to keep you out of where God wants you to be. The devil had all kind of things to keep them out of the promised land. When they went, were taken into bondage in Egypt, Egypt 400 years earlier, 440 years earlier, when they were taken in bondage, all these other pagan people took over this land. You see, this is the land that God had promised Abraham, right? And Isaac and Jacob. <coughs> this is the land that was theirs. It was their land. If we went on vacation... And we came back from vacation and someone was in our house, do you, would we say, I guess that's their house now? I wouldn't. Would you? You know what? The devil has taken over some of our lives. He's taken over some part of your life and he wants to eat your lunch. 
right? He wants to take things from you that God says is yours. It's rightfully yours. He wants to steal joy from you. He wants to steal peace from you. He wants to steal prosperity from you, right? He wants to take all the things, all the gain that you have. He wants to take your witness from you. He wants to steal from you and try to take everything he can from your life. What we have to do is be, be brave and fight the giants. You know what? The giants probably would have holed up in their area. I think it's the uh, Hazor, the first line in cha chapter 11, verse 1, the king of Hazor. Hazor means castle. So this was sort of like the capital of all Canaan. This was like their, their main fort, right? This was the castle. And you know that when you win the castle, you've won the game, right? When you go in and you defeat the king, the, the high king, you've taken the high general or you've taken battle for the flag, you know that you've won. Well, this was the victory that they were looking for. But it had giants. What if they had said at that point, we've done well up until now, but these giants, we better just leave them alone. That sounds foolish because we know how the story comes out. But what if in your life you had a giant in your life and you said, I guess I just can't beat that one. I guess I can't be victorious in that area of my life. I guess I just can't win this one. Maybe you have tried to, to fight that giant and maybe you were not victorious in it and you just gave up. And that's one of the sad things. And the devil loves it when you give up. When you're investigating a battle, when you go in and you do your reconnaissance and you see what it's going to take to do this, and the devil says, you're not coming this way. I've already got this territory. Your life is changed, and this is no longer yours. It's just like that man that moved into your house when you went on vacation. He's taken something that's yours. What kind of giants do we have in our lives? You know, we know the story of the giants of David and Goliath. We know that these, these people, the giants were defeated. But we also know in, in the time of Moses that they weren't defeated, right? They could have gone in right then had they been obedient, had they been uh, at, kept themselves from sin, had they have had faith. All the things that we just learned in this book, had they had all those things, they could have already been in, in their 40 years. That's sad, isn't it? But it's also sad when a man or a woman lets their life go on because there's a giant in there and they're too afraid to conquer it. That was a good time to say amen. 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 That, that's a really sad thing when people let giants overthrow their lives and they, they live in fear the rest of their lives. So what kind of fear do we have? What kind of things do you have in your life that's a giant? Obviously, you know, you could have some kind of uh, fear about your ministry. Maybe God's got a ministry for you. You could have some kind of fear about dealing with people. You could have some kind of fear about finances. You could have a fear about some kind of health problem. There can be numerous ways that the devil can have a giant against you. That giant in this day was a physical giant. And we like to think about the story of a little shepherd boy with a slingshot and five smooth stones, but he only had to have one stone. Goliath had four brothers. Did you know that that's why he had five stones? Goliath had four other giant brothers that might have come out. He was prepared for four more giants. This was not just one giant. That's the thing about giants. You just never know. Right? You just never know what they're going to do. You don't know if they're going to have giant spears or giant bows or giant cannons. You just never know. They look big and bad, don't they? But the giants in your life are always a big puff of air. They're always something that you're going to be able to defeat with God on your side. God does not want giants scaring you. You know, he, don't, he doesn't let giants scare him. The smallest child in here, if I took you by the hand and we went up to uh, someone that had a big bad dog in their yard, that child wouldn't have to fear because daddy's holding her hand, right? The same way that if you go into place that's yours and there's a giant that's moved in you don't have to worry because father god's holding your hand father god is leading you amen so we're looking here at these battles 
simply by obedience and by having courage, he did this. Then it occurred to me as I'm talking about all these battles <coughs> that we looked at all the warfare in this book, but without thinking about the armor of God. You know, these people, I want you to picture them that they had the armor, right? They had spears, they had shields, they had helmets. They had <coughs> what they had in this day of, as a military power. These folks had chariots. And if you look in verse um, verse 9, And Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him. He hawked the horses and burned their chariots with, with fire. Hawking the horses was cutting the hamstring on the horse's leg so he couldn't walk. That's that's cruel, isn't it? But that would be equivalent to, to um, taking a tank, a modern-day tank, and knocking one of the tracks off of it because this was an uh, animal of battle. So the, the army went in, and that's the first thing. They may have caught these horses when they were in the corral before they ever hooked the chariots, and they disabled these horses, and then they burned the chariots. And they said, what are you going to do now? Now what are you going to do, you big giants? Because you run slow, right? And you need to see that the giant that you had in mind is nothing more than something like a nightmare that you shouldn't have even been afraid of. Amen? We all have those things, don't we? We all have giants. We all have that one thing that the devil loves to hold over our head. He loves to keep us, you know, you can, he'll let you be victorious in all these eight or nine areas, but this 10th area, he doesn't want you to be victorious in. And he says, that's my stronghold. You ever heard that word stronghold? Do you have a stronghold in your life? Do you have something in your life that the enemy keeps, he keeps that little area, maybe some private sin that you have that nobody, you think nobody knows about it, but the truth is other people know about your sin. That weakness that you have, that that um, handicap that you have, and it may be a, a spiritual handicap. I let the devil get the best of me one time. I was I was given a card to go visit some people at a church that you know do visitation, and somebody had filled in this man's name on the card for visitation. Guess what? That man didn't want me at his house. Somebody else put that man's name down there. So I showed up all young and naive thinking, you know, well, this man's asking me to come visit him and, and pray for him. And when I got there, they said, he's downstairs in the basement watching TV, watching football game. And I got down there and he looked over at me and then he, I saw him greet his teeth and stare at the TV. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm here from the so-and-so church and I came to visit. He never said a word. Oh, how do I get out of this? And I just, I just kept talking. And after about five minutes, I said, well, um, is there anything that that I can pray with you about? And he said, he looked at me straight in the eye. He said, I don't want your prayers and I don't want you in my house. And I thought, okay, do I just get up and leave right now? And I, I talked to some of the other people in the room and I finally just, you know, like, take care. I'll see you later. And, I, and that shut me down for many months. Because the devil put fear in my heart. He put fear in my heart. He used that situation to really grip me so that I was afraid to talk to people. He used that. And he will use it against you. He'll put fear in your heart of something. You'll have a, have a bad experience. You know, I went in on that job interview, but I just, I said something stupid and they all laughed at me and I, I don't think I could ever interview for a job again. You know what I'm talking about? He'll use a situation in your life that went wrong for you and cause you to not ever want to do that again. The truth is, as men and women of God, we've got to do that again, haven't we? We got to, you know, you're always talking about falling off the horse. You need to get back on the horse. And spiritually, if you had a setback, you need to get back on the horse, haven't you? Now, so we're going to look at the whole armor of God because if you're going to do battle, Spiritual battle, you need the whole armor of God. And that's what we have in Ephesians chapter 6. If you'll turn there with me, Ephesians 6. Those of you following us online, I posted all the scriptures that go along with this. But Ephesians 6 is the main uh, passage about the whole armor of God.
if you'll if you look at Ephesians 6, and we'll start with verse 10. Everybody go ahead and find it. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Now, as you're finding that, let me just say, had all of the Israelites in the time of Joshua shown up to the battle and didn't have their helmet on, didn't have a sword in their hand, didn't have a shield on their arm, didn't have anything protecting their chest, and they were all barefoot, do you think that they would have beaten the enemy? Of course not. Can you see a bare, barefoot bunch of soldiers running into battle? Ow, 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 ow. Right? I mean, it, we wouldn't win, would we? How about a soldier that shows up with no sword or no gun? What are you going to do, poke him in the eyes? <laughs> what? That's right. We wouldn't win, would we? How about one that has no shield? That when they start shooting arrows at you, you're trying to duck, right? You wouldn't win. And, and just like that, Christians cannot win without the whole armor of God, can you? How about if you have all that stuff, but you have no shoes or all that stuff, but you have no helmet? If you ever watch war movies, those guys always got helmets on, right? If you ever see a guy lose his helmet, he gets one. He finds one somewhere. They always have a helmet on. They always have shoes on. If the shoes tear up, they always find some boots somewhere, right? So we got to look at this in that, that way that we need all this stuff, and we need it every day, don't we? Ephesians 6.10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may, may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Paul makes a point twice here to say the whole armor. Now, if uh, the sergeant tells the, the privates, make sure you get your body armor, make sure you get your, your uh, gear. If he just uses the term gear and the guy gets his rifle, well, make sure you get your gear and he puts his helmet on and he shows up to the battle with just a helmet on. Like, did I have to tell you your whole gear, right? It's not just one thing that you need. Where I work, we have all kinds of things that the men wear for their protection. They all wear a hard hat. They all wear safety glasses. They all wear rubber gloves when they're working the lines hot. They all wear special boots that are dielectric boots. So that if they get energized, they're they're insulated from ground. They have all this stuff, and then they also have things they put over the power lines to cover that. They have to use all that. What if the guy wears no hard hat? What if he has no rubber gloves? Right? And if you do all that and you you've forgotten something, you're still not going to do it right. So Paul says all the stuff, the whole armor, the whole armor, the whole armor. And then he reminds us, you're not fighting physical battles. So what do we do? We, we think it's a physical battle because our neighbor's at odds with us. Because this guy over here, or this group over here, or these people over here, they're our enemy. No, they're not. The devil is your enemy. Those people are not your enemy. The devil may use them. He may use that situation, but they are not your problem. If they were your problem, you could take care of it with physical means. But it's not a physical battle, is it? That giant in your in your life that you're trying to overcome, it's not a physical giant, is it? Anybody ever seen a physical giant? No. Right? There's no physical giants around. There might be a guy that grows taller than everybody else. He's not a giant, right? There's no physical giants. But there are spiritual giants. Right? We know spiritual giants. We know spiritual giants that will come up uh -uh. He said, like problems in your life. Like problems in your life, exactly. The big problems in your life, they're not to do with people. It may be a person that the problem came through, but that person is not your problem. The problem is the devil hates you. Right? 
So stop getting mad and stop using carnal means to fight your battles. Right? Stop using physical means to fight spiritual battles. If I could, if I could just impress that one thing on everybody, that one thing, we, we do so many spiritual battles and we get mad at people, right? Or we try to get self-educated. Well, that person's always outsmarted me, so I guess I better go get my self-education. I guess I better study up the facts. No, that's not what you need to do. You need to pray. You need to put on the whole armor of God. That's what you need to do. You need to learn more about the word. <clears throat> Verse, 12, verse 14, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and all supplication for all saints. So here we have some some things, and I know that you young people in your in the school you go to, you've seen this. You've seen in a vacation Bible school. Some of you may have a little dress up set where you have on the the um, the whole armor of God, and you've seen this, right? You've seen the little doll that's got on the whole armor of God. So I want you to get that image in your head. Except that is just kind of a old time technique, isn't it? That's an old type way that they dressed. Modern the modern soldier doesn't dress like that. He's not in a little short skirt with a with a sandals on, right? He's got body armor on. He's got a, a different looking helmet on. His body armor will stop a bullet from coming in, right? So all these things, if they were brought into modern times, would be that way. So let's look at the armor of God. First of all, it talks about loins girt about with truth. So the first place it starts is truth. We have truth that has to everything hinges on. Did you know that the belt is one of the places where all the gears is mounted, right? You see the soldier and he's got all the belt, all the stuff on the belt. He's got his canteen. He's got his extra ammo. He's got um, all kind of uh, medical supplies, right? He's got all his stuff on his belt. So think about that belt. That belt is truth. And when we look at truth in the Bible, um, let's look at John 17, 17. I've got it on the board here for you here locally. Jesus said, sanctify through them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And this was Jesus talking, and he was talking to God and praying for us. And he said, your word, Heavenly Father, is truth. There's a lot of... Um, a lot of people argue and want to stir up about what tr is truth. Can truth actually be said? Can you actually define what truth is? Well, that may be truth for you, but it's not truth for me. You know, that'd be like arguing, is the red light what we stop on, or is it the yellow light or the green light? That, that's that been settled a long time ago. But people might still argue, well, you can go through there if it's red. You can go through that intersection on red. Well, you can try it if you want to, but I'm going to go through the other one on green, and you may be coming through on red. Right. So we argue these these dumb arguments about well, is the word of God. Did it change? Was it was it translated accurately? You need to end all that. If that's going on in your mind, if the devil was making you doubt the Bible, you need to end all that. You will never be victorious if you don't know truth. Amen, brother Paul. If you don't know what truth is, you will not win. Right. You won't win. You'll be just like a soldier without a belt on. Can you imagine they're running across the battlefield and their pants all stop falling down? <laughs> right? They look around for, for the extra ammo. Well, it was on the belt that fell off. Right? So we wouldn't do that, would we? <clears throat> Thy word is truth. How can a Christian know what the will of God is if he never reads the word of God? It can't happen, can it? If you never study the Bible, you will not grow. You will not know what truth is. And all the rest of this stuff works on that. It works off the word. Thy word is truth. In Hebrews 5, verse 13. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, 
even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, when you're young, people can, um, people can trick you a lot easier than when you become mature. Right? I, I see some of these kids come in and they say, hey, you want to see a trick? You want to see a card trick? You want to see this kind of trick? The, the truth is I've probably seen that trick before. Right? You can go ahead and do your magic trick for me if you like. But the truth is I probably already know what you're doing. I've seen that before. And when the devil has come after you year after year, you learn his tactics. Although sometimes we get fooled over and over again, don't we? Sometimes the devil will come in and he'll pull the same thing and you fall for the same thing over again. Right? It, it, do you have lollipop written up here? Because you're a sucker. Right? I mean, isn't that the way we feel when you get tricked the same way again and again? I let it happen again. Right? I let it happen again. I let it happen again. He loves it. It's like dangling a carrot out there for a goat, and the goat never gets the carrot. And he just puts something out there in your path, and you fall for it again. Learn truth. Learn by reason of, the, of their senses, exercise to discern both good and evil. Amen? You need to learn what truth is. So when you go to the hospital, and you have bad news to report from the doctor, and you say, oh, God didn't know this was going to happen. Yeah, he did. God didn't know I would be facing this battle. Yeah, he did. Well, I didn't know this. Was, I didn't know this. Maybe God's forgotten me. No, he hasn't. Because you know the truth, right? You know the truth so you can defeat the enemy. The next part is the breastplate of righteousness. This is in uh, Ephesians 6, 14, the breastplate of righteousness. Now, you've seen the Roman soldiers. They've got that big breastplate on, or, the, or even the knights with the armor. They've got that big metal shield. And now, modern-day soldiers, they have armor. They have body armor. It's got steel plates in it. It's a big, bulky, heavy, uncomfortable thing. But it's necessary, isn't it? Because guess where the enemy shoots when he shoots? You think he's going to shoot at your foot? You think he's going to shoot at your arm? He's going to shoot at your chest, right? He's going to shoot at the biggest part of your body. That's where the enemy shoots. So here's the breastplate of righteousness. Now, this part covers your heart and lungs, the parts that you can't live without. You know, if you get, get shot in the knee, you can survive till they get you fixed back up, right? You get shot in the arm, they can fix that back up. You get shot in the chest, you're probably not going to make it. So that's really important to have the breastplate of righteousness, correct? Everybody agree? Amen. Okay. The breastplate of righteousness covers your heart, doesn't it? So in Proverbs 4.23, it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence. So what happens when you get your heart broken? What happens when the devil comes in and breaks your heart? What happens when the enemy makes you lose heart? That's bad, isn't it? It's bad when you, you get your heart broken or when the devil causes you to, to be faint of heart. But when you think about your heart, everything it says the issues of life flow from it. <clears throat> and to protect your heart, to protect your heart. Amen. In Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise up unto David a righteous branch and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby we, he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. You see, your righteousness, your right works, your good works, are as filthy rags, according to Romans, right? Everything you do good, if you try to be good enough to get to heaven, you won't make it. Right? Because all the good works that a person can do without Jesus, they won't get to heaven. They could be really, really good people. Well, I didn't break any laws. I lived a good life. I didn't hurt anybody's feelings. Well, you're still not going to heaven because you don't have Jesus. So here, 
the breastplate of righteousness has to do with Jesus, our righteousness. And that passage says, the Lord is our righteousness. So being under Jesus, having him over your life, makes you righteous before God. Amen? Amen. Now, does it do that if you, do, if you just live any way you want to? No, it doesn't work that way. We have to make sure that we are following what Jesus said. Because he said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Correct? If you love me, keep my commandments. Put that up. You put it up. If you love me, keep my commandments. So we have to be obedient to the Lord. For the Lord to be our righteousness. Right? <clears throat> the next thing is. Feet shod with the gospel of peace. That's in verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, again, I said it would be foolish for a soldier to go on the battlefield barefoot. So if you get up in the morning and you go to work or go to your job or go to your school, or wherever you go to, and you don't have anything on your feet, you're going to regret it. Right? Here, we're talking about a spiritual thing that takes place every day of your life. Again, this armor has to be put on every day. Every day when you get up, before you say, howdy do, before you say, where's the coffee, you need to be putting on your, your uh, whole armor of God. Right? Amen. Have you ever noticed that the days when you just forget all this and you get up in a rush and you, right, you've had to, you, you're running late for something and, and you always have just like, Pillar after pillar after pillar after pillar fall. It's like dominoes. One hits another and they all hit. And he's like, I just had such a bad day today. And you, somebody says, did you put on the whole armor of God this morning? And you look at the ceiling because that's where all the answers are, right? You say, no. Well, that's why. I had such a bad day. Did, did you start with God? Did you start trusting in the Lord? Did you Did you pray? Right? Did you put on the, the belt of truth? Did you have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace? Did you read the Bible? Did you read a devotion? Right? No. But I had such a bad day. Connect the dots. Right? Connect the dots. You know what? I see people go through their lives and every day they're miserable. And every day they have failed to turn to God every day. It's like that I was talking about the devil tricking you over and over again. You're doing the same things and expecting different results. If you bake the cake and use this recipe, and every time I use that recipe, it turns out bad. Well, stop using that recipe, right? But we don't use wisdom a lot of times in the walk of Christ we don't just listen to what the word says and apply it to our lives. We think it applies to everybody but us. Well, you can do that if you want to. I'm fine on my own. Are you really? Or are you miserable? Is the devil whipping you every day of your life? Amen. We have to have our feet shod with the preparation of gospel peace. In John 10, 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. There's nothing better, no better um, example than watching a man who's a shepherd of sheep and he gets up and all the sheep are eating and he gets up and starts walking and they all start following him. You know what? Every day when granny goes down to the barn to feed, all the animals go down there, right? Because they know who she is. They know who that woman is. She can get up and go out in the field. They're all going to come to her. Because they know who she is. Now one of you might go out there and they'll, they'll run from you. But they know who she is. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. If you don't know the voice of God or don't know the voice of Jesus, you don't know his word, if you don't know that and know who he is, how can you follow? How can you go the direction he's asking you to go if you don't even know what his voice sounds like? And that goes back to that last passage where by reason of the use, they have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You learn through time, don't you? Amen? Amen. You learn through time. 
I, I went that way. The devil tried to trick me. I've learned that. I go this way now. In Galatians 5.16, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the spirit. I talked about this verse a few weeks ago. Walking in the spirit means to walk in step or in march step with the commander. It was a military term that talked about walking in a cadence, marching in cadence with the commander who is leading you. Have you ever watched a military group, group marching or, a, or even a high school band and how they're marching? And you notice that guy's in the front and he's doing this. Have you ever seen that? He's got a staff or she's got a staff and she's leading like this and she's got rhythm and she does something in rhythm and they all march in step. That's a pretty neat thing to watch, isn't it? Well, this passage in Galatians means to walk in, in the spirit is to stay in step with the Spirit. Do you remember I told you the story about I came home from work one day and I passed by Walmart and I said, am I supposed to go by Walmart? And I don't even understand why. But I stopped and then I walked around for 30 minutes. You remember I told you that story and I ran into pastor's wife and I mentioned something, somebody in need, and she said she didn't know why she was in there either. And then the next week I got a check for that person. They said, we want, the church wants you to have this money for that person. You know, when you think about it, if you just simply follow the voice of God, you will be in step with the Holy Spirit. But have you ever been disobedient and not listening to what God said and you went somewhere you're not supposed to go? Or maybe you was on the Internet and you went somewhere you shouldn't be going. And the next thing you know, you're in trouble. I shouldn't have looked at that website. Right. Right. That's one of the reasons I was against uh, alcohol in this county. We, were, we had a dry county for a long time. And you know what? If, if people drink, that's up to them. The, the Bible says not to get drunk. And I understand how people have a different interpretation of that. But I also know there's some alcoholics in this county. And I know that now they can stop by a store and get it. And I just don't think that's, that should be made available for an alcoholic to have it where he can just reach out and grab it. You know, if, you, if you're an alcoholic, you stay away from it, don't you? You don't go to bars if you're trying to not be an alcoholic, right? So if you're walking in step with the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Wow, that makes sense now, doesn't it? Because the Holy Spirit's not going to take you to some rock concert where they're all smoking pot. Uh, hello? Right? You know, the music of my of my childhood, I love, and if some band came around, I'd say, boy, I liked that group when I was younger, and I, my, I used to love listening to them when I was driving around in my car on Friday night. I used to love listening to that band, and I would not go to one now because they would be smoking pot, and they would be um, lots of things going on there that I don't need to be a part of. It doesn't matter how benign you think the music is, if they're going to put on a show, and everybody around them is going to be partying and drinking, smoking pot. You don't need to be there. Period. Pretty easy, isn't it? Because the Holy Spirit's not going to take you to those concerts. Oh, well, Brother Paul, you're just being judgmental. I'm just trying to give you some wisdom. I'm trying to keep you from getting in trouble. Keep in step with the Holy Spirit and your feet will be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The shield of faith. Now, there's a lot of a lot of uh, scripture I could have used on faith. I saw all these had a lot of scripture. I'm just using one or two verses per, per um, article of the armor of God. The, the shield of faith. So think about that. The shield. Now, oftentimes you may think of the big Roman shield that they had linked together. Big rectangular thing. You think of the Viking shield. It was round. It was made out of wood. And the shield that this was looking at in Joshua's day was actually not, neither one. It was not a big metal thing. It was not wood. It was more than likely a big animal skin, an animal that had tough skin. And these things were some type of leather. And before the, the battle, if they thought the enemy was shooting fiery darts at them or fiery arrows, they would go down to the river and they would dunk that shield in and wet it 
and they would go into the battle, and if the fiery dart hit that, it would extinguish it. Hmm. Now, how could we put that to a spiritual matter? Well, washing of the water by the word. Amen? The word is alive, and it, it washes you, doesn't it? And it, it quenches your thirst, and it quenches the fiery darts of the devil. And if the devil fires at you, and you've got the faith there, you say, I don't care if something bad happened. I don't care if I get attacked today. It doesn't matter. He's attacked me before, and he did not win, and he won't win today. Right? Because we have the shield of faith. James 2, 24 through 26, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Faith without works is dead. So that means your faith needs to be an active faith. Now what is an active faith? An active faith is... I want things to grow in my garden, but we were in a drought. So I'm not even going to bother plowing or planting. Is that an active faith? No. How about, well, we're in a drought, but I'm just praying and believing. I have faith that God's going to make things grow. So I'm going to go ahead and plow and put my seed in the ground and pray for rain. Is that active faith? Yes. So what is the active faith? in your life that you need to have a shield of faith it needs to be something that you take action in if you get up on sunday morning you say i just believe that you know god loves me even if i don't go to church well he's everywhere he's on the golf course right we all know he's out there in the fishing hole right oh god's everywhere i know there's a good party going on somewhere and I'm going to go to that because, you know, God will be there. That's not active faith, is it? If you get up in the mornings and you take that kind of attitude and you say, I don't have to do anything. God's already saved me, so I don't have to do anything. That is not taking the shield of faith because faith has to have action, doesn't it? The helmet of salvation. Verse 17 in Ephesians 6. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So that's two things. The helmet of salvation. Again, the soldier of today, he wears a helmet, doesn't he? I have seen a lot of pictures from the different wars where helmets had uh, bullet dings in them. I remember a man in, um, that was in World War II that I talked to in, when I was in high school. And he knew someone that had a bullet go in one side of the helmet and spin around inside his helmet and burned a, a line out of his hair, but the helmet saved his life. I've seen pictures with bullet holes to go through and it glances off. So helmets save, save lives, don't they? What about your helmet? What would your spiritual helmet be, be guarding? Right, your thoughts. Your thought pattern, right? So if your thought pattern is not established the enemy that means you have no spiritual helmet on do you you have no helmet of salvation in first john 5 verse 10 john said he that believeth on the son of god hath the witness in himself he that believeth not god hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that god gave his son and this is the record that god has given hath given it to us eternal life and this life is in his son he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath of God hath not life. And I've highlighted in yellow here for you. These things have I written unto you that you believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. I remember my dad getting into a discussion with a man one time who said, you just can't know if you're saved or not. You won't know till you till we get to the day of judgment. You just can't know. And my dad always quoted this verse. And it says that ye may know that ye have eternal life. So do you think you can know if you're saved? I think so, don't you? These things have I written unto you that ye may know that ye have eternal life. 
So John wrote these things so that we could know that we have eternal life. So what, how am I connecting that to the helmet of salvation? The salvation that you have, first of all, you need to know that you're born again. You need to wake up in the morning when you're putting on your whole armor of God and say, I am a child of God. It doesn't matter what I did yesterday. It doesn't matter what I failed in last week. It doesn't matter how the, the devil's eaten my lunch so many times in the past. Today, I'm going to win. Today, I'm going to overcome the giants. Right? What, what if Joshua, after um, Ai, what if Joshua had let that set him back? What God said was, get up and go back to battle. Right? He, he was really sad about that. And that's a sad thing. But sometimes it's time you got to get your big boy pants on and just move on, don't you? So in the morning when you get up and you're putting on the whole armor of God and you're protecting your thoughts, you say, I will just establish it right now that I am a child of God. I will establish it right now that I've been born again for many years. I know what the devil will try to do. He will try to make me doubt my salvation today. The enemy will try to make you doubt that you really have any connection with God. Well, you failed. You remember that time you failed? You remember that thing that you failed in? You big failure, right? Isn't that the way the devil attacks us? He tries to bring up something that we didn't do well on. He tries to bring up something that we failed in, and we may have failed in it over and over again. And he will say, see, you're not a child of God. If you were, you wouldn't have done that. And the last one is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And even that, the devil will say, you don't really have to read it. Do you own a copy? That's good enough. All right, do, you have a, do you have a Bible? You have a Bible? Okay, you'll be okay. Just don't read it. You know, if you read it, just don't read much of it. You know, just don't read, don't read the Old Testament. That's not relevant for today. And you can throw away everything after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? You just need this. Well, actually, Psalms and Proverbs, if you just want to read that, you're okay. And the devil will narrow you down. And then the second thing he will do is he will start telling you, well, it's not interpreted right for today. Oh, they had some mistakes in it when they interpreted it or when they wrote it down. And he'll start trying to make you doubt that the Bible that you have is the Bible. He'll start trying to make you believe that's not really the word of God. Well, a God, but how about the God? Is he, he might be your God, but he's not everybody else's God. And every thing he does, he will try to deceive you into taking up the sword of the spirit. Do you realize that all those, in those picture images of all these parts of the whole armor of God, this is the only one you fight with. The rest of it are protective, aren't they? The helmet protects. I suppose you could butt somebody with your helmet. The shield protects. The breastplate protects. The belt protects and keeps everything together. Right? The shoes, they just protect your feet. And this sword is your weapon. And it's the Word of God. And if you don't know the Word of God, you can't be using it, can you? Have you ever seen those uh, pictures or those little video clips where the sergeant is training the the uh, soldiers to break apart their guns and clean them and put them back together quickly and they have a certain length of time they do it and they they're out there and they have to field strip the, the gun and put it back together and um that's something i'm terrible about is cleaning my weapon after i've shot it i just i hate cleaning the gun but in the military you don't want to go into battle with a dirty gun right and those weapons that they shoot are made to take apart in a foxhole. They, they can take a bullet, literally the tip of the bullet, and they can unscrew everything. Did you know that? They can take the weapon apart, break it down, put it back together. And I know sometimes they make those soldiers do it blindfolded because you're going to have to do it in the dark. Do you know the Word of God that well? Do you know it backwards and forwards, or do you just kind of know I know Mark comes after Matthew. I don't. I couldn't tell you where Jeremiah is, right? And then these children are learning the books of the Bible in order, right? So do we know that? Do all of us know that? Do we know where all the books of the Bible are? Do we know what's in those books? 
Do we know how all this fits together? That's, that's the part of Bible study that we put together, isn't it? And that's the sword of the Spirit. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and, it is, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I like that because it goes along with that other one about having our senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You don't know what good and evil are, what righteousness and unrighteousness are, if you've never studied what God said they are. There's plenty of people out there in the world tell you what's right and wrong. Oh, there's nothing wrong with that. You can do what you want to. There's nothing wrong with that. Everybody does this. And yet the Word of God will convict you, won't it? 2 Timothy 3.14 says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And that's what I want you to be today. I want you to be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Amen? Know the word of God so that you can be thoroughly furnished. Now I want to close, and I want us to still be thinking about battling your giants. Battling your giants. I know it's been, I've gone long today, and some of you are just tired, and you, know, you ate just not too long ago, and that was a little different part of our day. I want you to think about your giants today. Think about what is the big battle for you, or the big thing that you've given up on. The big thing that you let defeat you, right? I mean, maybe you, you wanted to do this in your life and you kind of started that way, but you had some setbacks, you bit off more than you could chew, or maybe it was just the wrong time in your life to do that. And, it, and the, God wants you to go back and do it again because that's the giant that you've never defeated. You might have somebody in your life that the devil is using to really torment you, to try to ruin your witness. And you need to overcome that in your brain, don't you? In your spirit, you need to overcome that thing and say, you know what, I can't help what other people think about me. I just need to think about what doing the right thing and just go on at peace with that, amen? But you can let that be a giant in your life. You can have some setback of relationships. You can have setbacks with money. And so many times we have these things, whatever the, the giant is in your life, don't let that giant overcome you. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Do not let that, that enemy overcome you. Make sure that you know that you can do all things through Christ who, who Jesus. Amen? You can do all things. You can defeat those enemies. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I, I pray that we would allow the word of God to inspire us today to set us free from the enemies uh, that have come against us in the past. Lord, so many times the devil will have giants that will come up in our life that we will just avoid. We'll have things that we have always just uh, allowed us to be in fear when we get in that area of our life. So we've just avoided them. And I pray that today would be the day that someone would make their mind up that they were going to defeat that enemy so that they can move forward and live in the fullness of the life, uh, the life that you have promised for us, Lord, in the promised land. Lord, just as Joshua and the children of Israel were obedient and have faith and courage and they didn't list, they had wisdom, they didn't listen to trickery. Lord, just as, as we've learned all these things from the book of Joshua and they overcame their giants in the end, Lord, help us to grow in Christ today. Help us, Father, to, to learn through the word of God something that we need to, to grow in today. And I just thank you for victory for the children of God today. In Jesus' name, amen.